What happens when you purify your body, your mind, your spirit? Something miraculous. The body begins to heal itself. Welcome to the Medicine Girl Podcast, where each week we explore new ways to heal your body from the root, igniting your inner healer. You are a medicine. And now, here's your host, Robin Stebbins. Hello and welcome to the Medicine Girl Podcast. It is me, your host, Robin Stebbins, and today I am beyond thrilled to have Laurel Erica with me. Um, and Laurel, I, my audience is a lot of doctors, nurses, medical professionals that see the intention of a sick based system to keep you sick, weak, dependent to creating a well-based system that essentially looks at the poisons and the toxins and removes them. And you let the body do what it does best, and that's heal itself. In that, I and I always say this and have always said this to my patients. I worked in mental health. I would say, your words have power. Stop labeling yourself. Stop diagnosing yourself. And this is where this book that you wrote, and I like how somebody described you as if Dr. Seuss and Shakespeare had a child. Here we are. Laurel. <laughs> so for those in my audience that really want to set intentions, and I think this is a really good time of year to set intentions, what should they know about you? Wow. For setting intentions. Let me go within for a moment before I speak. Intentions are powerful. And one of the things that keeps them from manifesting as we want, one of the primary drags on our intentions are the um, unconscious hidden agendas and biases. So we can watch something and even the word want means lack. So I prefer to want something mm. and, 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 there's so much that goes on unbeknownst to us from our early programming. And so, as you know, from uh, exploring my work to the extent that you have, what I've discovered is that English programs are thinking. It creates, uh, the word creates the lens on which we view the world. Yes. And we all come in with such extraordinary capacities that are mostly overlooked or paved over by um, the consciousness of the culture, the school system, the religious system. And so when setting an intention I like to go within and to discover what within me is seeking a fuller expression through me and as me. And I wrote a piece um, a couple of weeks ago called Hold Your Intentions Firmly and Your Plans Lightly and then be prepared to ride the wind. So last year, my intention was to cultivate imperturbable equanimity, the ability to stay balanced and ride the waves of ups and downs that we all encounter. And of course, with that intention, it was like <laughs> the attitude can be ordering concierge service in other words, the divine intelligences that work with us um, to shift my consciousness so that I'm no longer so reactive to circumstances. But what happens instead is that a powerful intention is like a powerful depth charge that brings to the surface everything that interferes or 
as I like to write it, interferes with the fulfillment of yeah. that intention. So I had quite an amazing year last year, not one that I would have chosen or designed for myself, but one through which I had the opportunity to stay pretty level um, in my moods by not coloring experience with opinion and judgment, but just having, uh, having the experience as if I were watching a character in a story and um, seeing, seeing what was going on and what responses were coming to the surface that I might want to address because these very reactive responses are what can manifest as all sorts of diseases in our lives. So that's for starters. I love that. I want to unpack every single word that you said because it's, it, it is so meaningful and it is exactly where I have been in my journey. So uh, to, to be reactive is to be controlled. To be quick to anger is to be controlled by that emotion that you've assigned meaning to. So I, I like to pan out as much as I can in my human form and to see how did we get into this mess in the first place? Um, the lowest common denominator, I call it. And to me, that is we allowed there to be a translator between us and God, us and our divine, us and our wisdom, us and our intuition. And in that translator, what you said so eloquently is that there's an agenda. And, and as we take on, let's say, this English language, the vibrations and the intention of my words are creating a frequency. That frequency can be measured outside of my body. It can be measured inside of my body. If it's not in a harmonic or harmonious resonance with mother nature, with the earth, we are out of alignment. We are in a disease state. Yes. So in, in that, um, the programming of our thinking, the programming of our language, the programming of our culture. They begs the question then, how do we know what is our programming and what is our mother tongue? As you say in, your, in this wonderful book, Word Magic, the mother tongue is what we came in innately knowing before we were told stop fantasizing and stop doing this and sit still and learn these facts and figures and stay inside all day, stop being you. Be, uh, so then we start speaking their words. We start believing their words. How do we now as adults separate that out? So I want to now unpack what you shared. Also bring it down to um, a level of immediate um, simplicity. So I will give a little background about my work, which I began as a toddler. I was playing with the symbols of the alphabet and words. I was fascinated with them. So <clears throat> in 2010, I put together a sentence that I call our premier life sentence, and it's available on the internet. It's called The Secret Spells of the English Language. And rather than go, well, I, I feel like I'll go through it very quickly so that people know what we're talking about. So the, uh, what I call our life sentence goes this way. We awake each morning and go off during the weekdays to earn our living at various jobs and undertakings until we come to the weekend. And everyone agrees that's how it is. And more people die of heart failure between 6 and 10 a.m. Monday morning uh, than any other time of the week. So we speak of trains of thought not realizing that our thoughts are trained by our words and that these conveyances have hidden cargo. 
So the hidden cargo in that life sentence um, is the fact that the word awake, we awake each morning, awake is a party celebrating the dead. Morning is the state when we are in when we attend awake. Um, the popularity of zombie culture is so interesting when we describe how we, we um, go through the week days or in a week days mm -hmm. to earn the living and earn your vases for the ashes of the dead. And we call our jobs appropriately undertakings as we race to meet deadlines. Job itself is a Hebrew word for persecuted. And what we get at the end of this perverse bargain with life is progressively weakened. And so our most prevalent greeting to each other is hello. And if you reverse the syllables, it becomes oh hell. So <clears throat> when I put that sentence together back in the 90s, I thought it was really interesting, but I didn't know uh, what to make of it. Was it just an interesting coincidence? And coincidence is a word that labels and then dismisses as insignificant the fact that one, two or more um, seemingly unrelated words or sounds or people have somehow arrived at the same place at the same time. So I like to think of it as a, a coincidence or a co-inside dance. And I remember a line from a Dylan song in the 60s where he said, take what you can gather from coincidence. And so that's what I did. And that's how I created word magic around all of these coinciding words. And um, when you speak about um, how can we as adults uh, know <laughs> that in truth, as I've found, we're walking through a mind field and there are these subliminal explosions that we detonate as we speak. Even the word adult, if you put it into two words and turn the, the U into an O, it becomes adult, which is an idiot. And the, the depressed alcoholic uh, poet Charles Bukowski of the 20th century said that most everyone is born a genius and buried an idiot. And it's because the genius goes unseen, unrecognized, uncultivated, and often denigrated. So we don't even know that we come bearing these precious gifts that the world knows not of until we share them with the world. And it's when we get those kinds of misdirections, it can we can be a late bloomer because who knew <laughs> that all these gifts were within us. Beautifully said. And, and I, <clears throat> part of my mission statement is that no one leaves this world without opening their gifts. Oh, that's so beautiful and so thrilling. And this is the time we all took birth for. I wrote uh, a piece called Speaking Beauty, an anthem for our era, which is about our, our superhuman, our supernatural capacities. I mean, and if you just look down on a freeway when you're coming in for a landing in an airplane or just even standing on a tall building, you see we live in a teeny tiny world. And and yet we have these outsized emotions and, and could just about, and are tearing down the sets. We're destroying all the structures that have supported us before in part because they supported us falsely yes. and, and subverted us. And as I was driving to connect with you, I have all sorts of, because I've played with words so long, I've seen a lot in them. And I was thinking of some of what I've seen. And, and one is that I, I now have become quite open about uh, expressing my um, deficits because I saw that my faults 
are not what is true about me. My F-A-U-L-T-S are F-A-L-S-E. It's not my true self. And then, uh, and I was thinking of another, and I'll put these two together, that the fires of transformation sear. In other words, they burn us, but they burn away the dross and they make sears of us so that we can see what's really going on. And so part of my role, in a sense, with what I do with words is like, helping the fish see the water all around us because we swim in the sea, S-E-E, -E, of our words. And I show where there is the toxicity within them that we can tune up or, or outright replace. And then there are the wisdom words, the words that reflect our innate genius to us. And I call those sacred path words um, uh, contrasting with the secret spells of the English language. Um, what came up for me just, just then, and I think it's so important to see, is we, were, we are underwater. We're not born underwater, but we slowly sink down and we think we're breathing air. And it's confusing and it's dark and it's difficult to communicate under underwater. It's almost like the underworld. And our words, our beliefs create that confusion. They create this, this darkness being underwater without being able to see it because we don't have the language to express this slavery that we have boxed ourselves into We've been programmed into seeing the delusion, not the truth. So especially right now, told over and over, stop believing your lying eyes. I believe what I'm telling you, the tell lie vision, the programming they're seeing on this box waiting for instructions on what does my world look like because I can't trust my eyes. I can't trust what I'm seeing in front of me. So you create a delusion that I can then force myself into because everyone else has, has accepted a group acceptance of this delusion yes. of being slaves in it, this world where we do not have to be slaves. So true. So lots you said that I want to respond to. And I am a writer without ink in any of the pens around me. So I wasn't Here's able one. to make notes. <laughs> so, <laughs> but I have a really good memory. So I'll just go backward in terms. Of, well, so that's so fun. Okay. So I wrote what I call my fairyography, which is about an elemental being who goes through the looking glass into this dimension and has to deconstruct the language to find her way back home again. And uh, about the middle of page one, my fairy character, Philomela Nightingale, says, I was born in upside down town to the king and queen of backward land. I spoke a foreign language, which they had to twist to understand. The king was sowing sorrow and the queen was reaping grief. I held my dreams, but lost my way, confused beyond belief. How ossified the king in patriarchal misconceptions and how brilliant was the queen in monumental self-deceptions. And I wish that I could say that they were singular exceptions, but they were the rule, as I know you'll confirm with your reflections. So I bring that up because I look at this dimension of existence as backward land. And um, I've become friends with a man named Jeffrey Armstrong, also known as Kavindra Rishi. And Jeffrey has studied the Vedas for 50 years or more and is a Vedic astrologer, 
He is an extraordinary poet, and he is a Sanskritist. He just recently came out with um, his radical new translation of the Bhagavad Gita by someone who knows Sanskrit as well as English. And one of the things that Jeffrey told me early on was that uh, Sanskrit, which is still a spoken language, has twice the number of the letters in its alphabet as we have. And when I heard that, it was staggering. I thought, that's how it is that we ran straight into the looking glass and got stuck. We are so limited in the language that we have available to conceive uh, dimensions of reality and states of consciousness that are available to everyone. And yet, if you can't articulate it, if you don't have the word with which to conceive it, um, it's essentially um, a closed door for you. So I have a brief blog uh, called Is Western Civilization Dyslexic? And it begins with a wonderful statement I found um, in the preface to a book called The Way of Weird, Tales of an Anglo-Saxon Sorcerer by Brian Bates, which is a novel composed of uh, records of Anglo-Saxon um, shamanism. And Fred Wolf in the preface said that when the Christians came to power, everything that had meaning to the native people, the Anglo-Saxon people was considered wrong and was reversed 180 degrees. And I thought, wow, that's backward land. And he goes on to say that that affects everything, including the English language you speak today. So my belief, um, my hypothesis is that the reason people could lose their heads for holding different beliefs is because we are collectively conjuring the life stream together. And if you have dissenters who are not using their mental energy to buy into the popular, uh, the popular narrative and manifest it moment by moment, they become dangerous. And that brings us to the current situation where <laughs> Fauci can say the science says this, but cite no science and refuse to debate the actual scientists who have no vested interest in people believing one way or another. So I, we have so many areas of pollution and, and dissolution, and it all comes back to we are the source of it all, what goes yes. floating through our minds. And so becoming aware that the language is loaded with secret spells everywhere you step, with every word you speak almost. And uh, people have noticed dis-ease and his story, which I'm now writing hid story, H-I-D. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they're aware of it, but not the fact that the language does this all the time. And by becoming more aware of it, we step out of the brainwash. We also see the, the illuminating words like our, her earth and heart. The fact that they are the same word <laughs> says to me that the first and foremost step toward averting disaster from the global warming of the earth is through a global warming of the heart. So anyway, your turn. <clears throat> wow. Um, all, all of that rings so true because I, I truly believe that is the solution out of this. Mother nature gives us the blueprint. So to understand harmony within nature, it's not what I think some people get lost in is just the one-sided coin. It's just peace, love, light. Nature in harmony is the pendulum of chaos to peace. It's the balance. It's, it's, it's surfing 
so that you're constantly in that state of, cor of course, correction. It's just a, it's, and it's a dance. It's the dance with the rhythm of nature. It's the music of nature. So in that, um, I, I like this backward land because it reminds me of, of what I'm seeing with a sort of an Orwellian creation. What is disease is wellness now. Um, the, 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 the need to label ourselves, meaning you are diabetic, you are schizophrenic, you are fill in the blank. It becomes you. Now, what has happened and what was surprising to me when I worked in locked psychiatric hospitals and now as a registered nurse in home health, people do not want to lose their labels. They have made love to their illness. They have made love to their label. Um, so, so in that, it's, it creates a, if I could, a hierarchy so that you are either above or below the authority or you become the authority or you become um, better than this person, worse than that person. What I have come to see with my belief is that if this person goes to McDonald's and eats McDonald's, it is part of the collective. We are creating this collectively. We are creating this so that if, if we're not all in harmony with mother nature, we are all out of harmony with mother nature. So it's the collective, the plant kingdom knows that when you do better, I do better. The idea of this Darwin survival of the fittest dog eat dog is a lie that we've been sold to create that disease state. So in this, the, the, the dangerousness then, I guess, or the danger is this creation of separation, believing that we're separate from one another. What is a separate cell? A separate cell is a cancer cell. It's lost the cell to cell communication and it believes it has to replicate out of harmony with nature to survive. So we have become these individualized cancer cells based on the programming and the delusion that we have been fed. But in order for us to see it, it had to get to this stage. It had to get to this stage of, wow, now I can see it. What, what will the point be where, and I'm glad you mentioned Fauci, it's, he says, I am science. You know, at, at some point, it has to get to that level of saturation or the level of critical mass where the mass will see this as critical. Wake, waking up collectively, because that's the only way to do it. I believe we have that potential to collectively awaken. That doesn't mean we all believe the same thing, the exact opposite. We all can now tap into what does my heart song? What are my gifts? So it's not, you know, the, there's a better tree in the forest than this tree in the forest, or they stand at the edge of the forest applying. We are the forest. We are the ocean. We are the eagles flying. So if I think we could understand that we are all one collectively, it would help to, to bring us forward. See, and it can seem disconcerting. Uh, the metamorphosis, the, the, dis the dissolving into the goo. It's not comfortable. But again, what is discomfort? We've been told what's uncomfortable. We've been taught what's pain. We've been taught what's, what all of these things are to separate us from our, our natural understanding of what is, lights me up and what I shy away from. Yes. Um, that was, that was long winded. Sorry. And it probably got <laughs> confusing. No, but, well, so I'll, I'll go back this time. I, I, I took some notes. Um, so let's see what you mentioned Orwell 
and Orwell, we, we speak of this as Orwellian times. Oh, you know, I never put together, I'm going to step back, that life sentence, the secret spells of the English language, I had a big so what, this is interesting, but so what? And the so what was the recognition that language is software, and that English is the leading software of the Western mind, yes. that it's filled with cultural biases that are akin to computer viruses that reflect an antiquated and manipulated vision of reality promulgated by the church as an instrument of mind control at a time when everyone had to surrender their minds if they wanted to keep their heads about them, quite literally. So what I discovered um, shortly after realizing that we could upgrade the language, um, someone gave me a, a letter to the editor that was in the Wall Street Journal in the, the early, around this time of, in 1999 called Corrupted Language, The Great Destroyer. And it quotes uh, Orwell as saying, politics corrupts language and language once corrupted has corrupting real world influence. And it quotes, um, Plato quoting Socrates saying that incorrect language is not only a mistake in itself, it implants evil in men's souls. And it quotes Confucius, the same article. And when people order my book, Word Magic, Word Play That Puts a New Spin on the World, which uh, uh, I collected a sprinkling of my verse that illuminates my mystic linguistic perspective on English. And there's also a CD, if anyone still has a player, uh, where I'm reciting it with background music. But um, in it, I quote uh, many people, and Orwell among them, who says that we, you know, that politics corrupts language, but we can begin to make a difference by starting at the verbal end. Just as Confucius said, if given charge of the governance of a country, the first thing he would do would be to correct language. So we're at a time when we feel overwhelmed by the powers that be who are so blatantly um, egregious in their assault upon humanity, even down to small children. Yes. And, and yet we have the power of the word. We don't put a lot of stock in that for the most part. And yet it isn't just the Genesis myth that says the word is the creative force in the world and, uh, and in the cosmos, sound and vibration. Uh, Eastern cultures say the same, many of them, indigenous cultures. So we have a power that we can use collectively to discover what brings us the greatest pleasure. And for me, one of the greatest pleasures is speaking beauty, not the trash talk, yes. <laughs> which puts garbage in a person's mouth, creates a vibration that lowers our frequency. And anyone who has ever seen the photographs of distilled water crystals yeah. that have been exposed to even printed words yes. in languages. Beautiful intentions behind the words uh, create beautiful patterns. Um, negative ones create disintegrated patterns. And as you said, we're underwater. We're basically composed of water. The cell is 99% water. The body's about 70%. We are affecting our own internal harmony with the words that we use. And people have noticed lately that we have very aggressive, negative, cliche statements like, the first time I heard someone say to a person who was about to go on stage, break a leg, I thought, right. what does that mean? It's a curse passing as a blessing. And so for me, you know, I like to say sprout a wing. Um, and th there's lots of other sorts of, you know, I made a killing in the market today, in the stock market. And I remember during the Iran-Iraq war, hearing about a killing in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. These things become literal. 
going viral as the height of success on the internet. The, the whole world has gone viral now. Um, so we have this explosive creative power with which we can casually create mischief and do destruction or use the power of the word as a wand to fulfill our highest intentions. That, that's it. And, and I think it's so um, part of the four ab- agreements. You want to be impeccable in your word. Yes. Um, and I, I, I truly believe that. Um, and I, what I do for a living as a nurse is I look at where are you toxifying and poisoning yourself? And I don't just look at the physical poisons. That's a very small percentage. I always look at what is the, what is the repeat record that you are saying to yourself? I am um, one, and I, I've, I've mentioned this example before, but I ran a weight loss clinic underneath a physician who wanted me to spearhead it with patients that wanted to qualify for the gastric bypass surgery. So they did not want to lose weight. So you could see how motivated they were. They wouldn't change what they ate. They wouldn't change what they drank. I, but I convinced some of them to create a new mantra. So in that new mantra, I would say, you say, I am, I am healthy. I am beautiful, whatever that they would agree to. All of them lost weight to the point where they were angry with me because they said, now I won't qualify for the surgery. But I said, look at the power that we have. Look at the power we have with our words. Look at the power you have with a placebo or a nocebo. You can create a drug-induced state within your body with your beliefs. So in that, when we're impeccable in our word, who is labeling you? Who is giving you these diagnoses? Do not give anyone that power. Do not give anyone that power to be a translator between you and your divine self. So in that impeccability in our word, I like to save the last 20 minutes for solutions. So as people are getting inspired and and maybe becoming aware for the first time how negative they are, in their words, how much trash they are talking. Even my son's um, friends will say that they're teenagers. That guy was just trash talking. You know, that that's in their lingo. So for those listening and they want to create this purified, harmonious world moving forward, maybe some believing that they don't, they're just a drop in the ocean instead of an ocean in that drop. What can we, what's there, what are some tangible things that you can slowly um, guide this light to, to illuminate, to be able to see its magnificence? Okay. Thank you. Let me go within with that for just a moment. For me, uh, the greatest pleasures and illumination uh, creatively have come through playing with words. And at the same time that I posted the secret spells of the English language on YouTube, uh, which was 2010, I also posted the, uh, the solution to the problem that the secret spells reveals. And that is my word magic global anthem. And it's called taking command of the English language. So it outlines how we can do this, that we are, (laughs) words are like notes and we are their human instruments. So many of these notes are sour and flat. And yet we are giving them power 
through the vibrations we utter and through the belief we invest in them because we are creating our world through our words. And parenthetically, uh, because I, I used to be invisible in my writing, I was so shame-based that I only talked about the ideas or wrote about the ideas that enlivened me, not the... Um, the emotional disturbances that actually drove me within and into a reclusive place where I dug deep into the language and made a lot of discoveries. So uh, the saying, we teach what we need to learn, I am confessing to be one of the most egregious transgressors on the language, having had so much emotional pain in my life and looking to take the charge off it by talking about it and looking for someone to find the key inside myself. And yet um, having a, a, a vested interest in remaining stuck. So through my prayers, my affirmations, where instead of um, accepting someone else's label for me, I'm affirming uh, that I am a being of wisdom and kindness, or I, I'm affirming that I am filled with insight and um, the ability to see through the, the fog or whatever sort of affirmations I have. So I, you know, I'm still in the process of untangling and, and, and then making breakthroughs and see why I've stayed stuck doing the very thing I know better than. So I'm just saying that so to let everybody else off the hook. <laughs> but I love that you said that because we are human and we're not striving to be perfect because that is a robot and I do not want to be a robot. I do not oh. believe in transhumanism. I, I, I believe in the messiness that we are, and I believe in expressing our messiness because it gives us all permission to evolve within that messiness, you know, um, and, and I think the more trauma that we've had, it's almost like we have to regurgitate it when the body ingests poison, it throws up repeatedly until it's out. Exactly. And a phrase that occurred to me once is the fire that stole the tree now lights the diamond. So I felt having been born to it, what in my experience felt like the king and queen of backward land and um, not having my genius reflected to me, but growing up believing I was an idiot and an evil one at that. Um, it's like it, it had a, a huge impact on the life that I've led. So it's that vision of the fire that stole the tree. It was like a forest fire that just destroyed everything. And then I realized in that phrase, the fire that stole the tree now lights the diamond, that a diamond is compressed coal made of vegetative matter. And it's like what we lose, we regain in another form. And so all of us, this is a, a time of fire and ice. And both words are in the word sacrifice. Mm. And we have sacrificed our freedom. Our, uh, I heard one scientist say that uh, the appropriate word would have been to quarantine, not lockdown. Lockdown is for prisoners. So it's all being telegraphed. Oh. So in the, uh, my word magic global anthem, taking command of the English language, I give the example of um, commit random acts of kindness and acts of senseless beauty. And that was a download somebody received in a restaurant in Sausalito from what I read online. And that amazing download has traveled the world, has altered behavior everywhere it went. So you wonder what can one little person do? 
and here's something else. People talk about wanting to make a difference in the world. And I like to point out that all you have to do is have a flat tire on the freeway and you will <laughs> make a difference in many people's world. So it needs the qualifier. I want to make a positive, I want to make a positive difference in the world by bringing out the best in myself to encourage the best in other people because we're like, you know, a whole keyboard. We have the lowest notes and the highest notes and it's the blend of all of it that makes the beautiful music. So my solutions that have worked for me are play with words and let them inform you. And download them. It's like genius is not a capacity some people have through their mental apparatus and right. others do not. It's a place we access in consciousness. For me, a point of access that helped me transcend the emotional miasma and get into a higher plane of awareness was a hit or two of marijuana ever so often. And boy, did I get a lot of downloads to the point that I don't need it to get them. But it's like, we are living in a sea of infinite intelligence, as well as what Reverend Michael Beckwith has referred to as the sea of human garbage, which is the collective unconscious and all the, um, all of the ugliness in that, but there is the, the greater intelligence that beats our heart, that breathes through us, that we can see in any moment, we can have genius ideas and come up with new words and share them and new metaphors that inspire higher consciousness. And um, with a, a, I'm looking to put together a team of people who want to work with me for a a literary lotto where people have a place to send in their divine ideas and we will share them, promote them. Um, I'll, I'll put out that vision shortly for others to see and anyone who wants to play, uh, let me know. That, that's, <clears throat> that I believe is the solution is play. Because I, I, I have a very similar story. I. I I believed I was very uh, stupid growing up and had no gifts to share, had nothing to say. Um, and as that pendulum swings, I, I don't believe there's a hierarchy either. And I know every single soul has that that gift. It's all different. So, so if we could see that within one another, there would never be a hierarchy. There would never be a, you're a throwaway. You don't matter. Everything, every single person matters. Every story matters. How do we draw that out? I think, um, especially now, a lot of my colleagues and I that are awakening to what's happening I say it's a very delicate, sacred dance to speak to somebody that's maybe awakening, maybe awakening to who they are in their sovereignty and in their miraculousness and, and in their gifts. You don't want to shut them down um, with your viewpoints with your ideas because they are yours so it's this give and take the sacredness um and and in that with these downloads i have books and books of of downloads that i don't know what i'm going to do with them all but i look back over them and i read them and i think this is genius what's genius about it is it wasn't me I was clear conduit and it came in through me that I could then write it down. I think in that, Laurel, that I don't need my name on it. I think that is, again, what I'm playing with. If I don't have my name on it, if there's no hierarchy, if there is no idea of separation, 
All I know is that when you do better, I do better. You do better, I do better. My plants do better, I do better. Just that level of, of conditioning within myself, being impeccable in my word to myself. Um, I'm doing a purification with people this month. And one thing we do every night is mirror work. So we look in the mirror and we say, thank you for staying on this purification. Thank you for eating these plants and preparing vegetables and for doing the hard work. I really appreciate you. High five or, you know, give yourself a kiss in the mirror, whatever it is that creates motivation. That creates motivation within to spread without all of us then can, can, revel in that that change that transformation of of the light embodiment of the light knowing that i get to embody the mess the dark those days like i did have a blowout on the la freeway last week driving to <laughs> to san diego and i did not handle it well i freaked out did i shame myself i would have in the past but no i just said oh, okay as that little girl i felt like i was six years old like what do i do in the middle of the la freeway my tire has exploded uh that's the messiness of life how do we handle it how do we how do we recapitulate recalibrate recenter to come back within ourselves it's like okay take a breath give that little frightened girl a, a pat on the back and a hug and say we got this we got triple a it's gonna be okay take a breath move forward no shame don't judge the self um so i guess that wasn't really so much as a question except for expanding on this inspiration that you have given me uh, and, and the inspiration I think you give all of us because you've tapped into singing your gifts, singing your soul song. Thank you. And I, I'm so uh, glad that you said you, we're not the author of the best of what comes through us. And I like to uh, let people know about Elizabeth Gilbert's TED Talk called Your Elusive Creative Genius. And she talks about the divine ideas that occur to us. And if we don't act on them, you're going to see them out somebody else's pen or mouth or, or whatever. So it's like the universe, the infinite intelligence of the universe is seeking to ex embody in us and express through us. And uh, one of the things I like to say is God or source, great spirit creates. And when we create, we feel divine. And I also read an article years ago in the New Yorker by Oliver Sacks, who I believe was a neurosurgeon, uh, called Musicophilia. And it describes a doctor who, uh, in the days before cell phones, was hanging up a, a telephone uh, in a phone booth, got struck by lightning, was propelled out of his body, which collapsed to the ground. He was not happy to be resuscitated and brought back, but he came back changed. He ultimately regained all his faculties, but he also had such an ear for music. He was hearing music. He wanted to hear all this piano music. He'd never been interested in that before. He had to be uh, buy a piano or, or Actually, he had a, he got a piano, learned how to play it, was hearing music, was composing it. It's like we're instruments. We are antennae. We are not the source of it, but we can be instruments of it. And so the inner work is to clear the space so that more and more of it can come through us. And when we allow it to, when we 
recognize that our faults are not what is true about us, that the genius is the essence of who we are. And as a human instrument, we have the capacity for the the heavy low notes and the high sweet ones. And what works most harmoniously is a blend of all of them where we get to be ourselves fully and experience the whole range of emotion and experience and creativity. You know, what, what really struck me when you were talking is, is I can picture a, <clears throat> a symphony of all of us that are speaking our soul song clearly, the yes. clear conduit that it can express itself. Um, what, what struck me when, when we had the lockdown and we all agreed to that energetically and physically, or, or, or most people, was I could see a cloud around the world of everyone speaking the same thing and I could feel it in my body. The fear, the and and everywhere I went, even when I went hiking, I could hear people talking about it and the mass, and I still do. You're giving an energetic vibration to this mass psychosis. Um, I had a really interesting experience with somebody during the winter solstice, and she said each time has their own disease, like the Black Plague or... Right now, the disease of our time is insanity. And in that insanity, we have to see the pendulum swinging to see what is the insanity, to release it, to see and, and become the sane, the song, the instrument. Play me. What, what, what music do I create? If, if we just ask that question and the other question I think that is most important that I bring up to everyone, including do you speak to yourself this way, but do you speak to me like you speak to God? And, and in that, do I speak to myself like I would speak to God? Do I, am I speaking to you? Do I speak to myself on the LA freeway with a blowout? And, and if we falter, that's, it can, the, it's easy to come back around because now I know that's my blueprint. You don't yell at the mountains for being too mountainous or the sun for being too sunny. Or am I yelling at myself for being afraid because my tire blew up in the middle of the LA, LA freeway? No, that's not how I would speak to God. So, so in that Laurel, I, want to be respectful of your time. I want to say thank you so much for spending this hour with me, for inspiring me. Your book I will have in the show notes. Highly recommend this. Highly recommend your Patreon channel. You're a gift to the world that, that I love to have to be in that light of. So in this closing do you have anything that you would like for to leave us with with wisdom and light thank you uh, and thank you for all your beautiful words it's been very fun to interact with you um, i mentioned the word hello and if you reverse it it becomes oh hell and you just said do you speak to yourself or to someone else as you would to God. I once asked a group of people, what shall we do about the word hello? And somebody suggested hallow. How about hallow, which is to, to make sacred or to recognize as holy. So if we say to each other, hallow, or many people who have seen the secret spells video um, say, grand rising rather yes. than good morning. <laughs> so the language can be reinvented word by word. I have a few words that I've created. Um, it can also be tuned up like hello to hello or this wonderful Turkish man named Arkan Selik, um, who is the voice for the poem, the animation I will soon post on Patreon, an animation uh, called 
Esoterica by Laurel Erica, the definitive exegesis on the letter S in verse. He's the voice behind it. He put the music on it. He doesn't say amen. He says, I'm in. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's a beautiful way to go. So um, my Patreon channel is patreon.com slash word magic global up till now i haven't done much with it but i am um i'm of a certain age where i would like to get a lot of the un incomplete projects of word magic complete and out in the world as more animations and as illustrated books and etc etc if you would like to assist you'll have the opportunity to have exclusive access first to esoterica and then to uh, the time of our lives which is a piece i wrote uh, quite some time ago, that's a pretty darn accurate reflection of this time that we're living. And um, they will be for people who wish to make a contribution to be a patron of my art, and you'll have exclusive access to the videos. So all that is coming. I also have classes for people who want to develop uh, their writing or develop as a writer. Ever so often, I teach word magic on my website, wordmagicglobal.com. Mm -hmm. the, the tagline is wordplay that unravels mass hypnosis and elevates the frequency of consciousness. On the home page, just scroll down a little bit and you'll see upcoming events. And if you subscribe to my website, I promise you will not be bombarded by emails, but you will have uh, access to my free ebook called The Book of E, A Book of Alphabet Alchemy. And my whole intention is to gift you with a mirror of your own genius so that you are flying high and sharing your beauty in the world ever more fully as we go through this amazing period of transformation. And, and that is exactly what we're doing. And you give us the wisdom and that's how we have that reverence for those that can see the eagle eye, they can pan out, they have the awareness, they have experienced the depth of all that is. So hello is a great greeting. I'm going to be using that. My friends and I always say grand rising now. Um, what's a good way to say, uh, aside from namaste or goodbye, what, what is a, a laurel word for saying until we meet again? Well, I, I, adios. Adios. I, I think that's quite beautiful. Borrow from other languages. Do I have a special one that I use? I can't think of one, but now I'll have to. Since yeah. you asked. And that's all. This is upgrading the language to yes. help facilitate our own essential evolution from humankind to human kindness is a collective creative endeavor that we can absolutely do together. Thank yes. You. Yeah. And it's playful and it's fun and there's no shame in, in create in co-creating this. Yes. I have a friend who is a coach and, and an intuitive mediumistic coach named Mary Alice Coleman, C-O-L-E-M-A-N. She has a book called Shatter, Shame and Shine. And that is such a, a beautiful metaphor. And so yeah, we are meant to shine. And it's, um, there's the word kintsukuri, a Japanese word about um, pottery that's been broken, yes. that is glued together yes. with glue that has gold in it. So we become even more beautiful when we heal yes. from those broken pieces. I, I love that. That's in, that is who we are in truth. And we are all have these broken pieces that that is the essence of, of what and who we are and, and become more beautiful because of that. And especially as we progress through this figure eight of, of the this life and this infinity that we are all on. Thank you so much for being on the planet at the same time I am. I am so grateful that I, I 
have been able to interact with you. And I certainly look forward to more in the future. Well, thank you. Me too. And let me just, um, one thing in terms of the wisdom, I'm not giving wisdom. I'm just showing you it's in the language. Thou, our innate wisdom is in the language and I've just gotten to be an early explorer of it. And um, lastly, in terms of beautiful, I once asked my uh, invisible friends, give me a new word and they gave me the true meaning of beautiful and it is beautiful. There's no greater beauty than our authentic full expression. Thank you. Amen. I'm in to that. <laughs> and with that, I bid you a fair adi- I do, I do, adios. Adieu. Ad- well, there's adios and adieu. Adios and <laughs> adieu. Yeah. And, and we'll figure out the, the good word for until we meet again. Wonderful. Thank you so much. <laughs>